And joining me on my panel today is Labor MP Graham Parrott from Brisbane and Liberal MP Dan Tian from Melbourne. Thanks so much for joining us today, gentlemen. Now, Dan Tian, hey, Laura, first to Dan. you. Having a look at these uh, details that Scott Morrison has released, only 214 people have arrived uh, by boat in the last three weeks under Operation Sovereign Borders. Can you claim this as a victory yet? Oh, I don't think um, we can claim it as a victory yet, but we're definitely sending a very clear message, and it does show by sending that very clear message that the policies are working. And it will not be solved, though, in two or three weeks. It's going to require a sustained effort over a period of time to show that we are absolutely serious in dealing with this issue, that the people smugglers will get nowhere under this new government. We're off to a good start but we must provide consistency and stability in the policy framework and make sure we continue to send that strong message uh, in the coming months. And that way we will make sure that our policies are truly effective. Yes, Graham Perrett, it is hard to see whether these policies are truly effective as yet. You kind of need to look at the long-term trend. But having a look at these uh, numbers, can you gauge, what, what do you think? Are these policies working? Yeah, I, I'm happy to agree with Dan on this. Uh, I mean, obviously they were trending south uh, before election night. Uh, the, the Manus Island uh, arrangements were and um, Nauru arrangements were a part of that process, and the, and the broader advertising. Um, obviously, the the suite of measures will all work effectively uh, over the the next few months depending on wars and circumstances around the world, but it's certainly good to see that the, the uh, Australian government's policies, uh, both under Labor and under the, the coalition government, are, are actually taking effect, which will mean there'll be fewer, the, the, the chance of people drowning at sea will be much less. Now, there was a lot of criticism, Graham Parrott, about Operation Sovereign Borders and the lack of information. I have to say, a lot of journalists, uh, it's still frustrating for us here. Uh, but do you think uh, by limiting this information, having one weekly briefing, do you think that has had an impact in terms of uh, not providing people smugglers with some critical information? Was that the right path to go down? Uh, I don't agree with that uh, at all. I think a, a, an open government is a good government. Um, I think this is uh, political chicanery rather than any, anything to do with management of our borders. Um, but, you know, good luck to Mr Morrison if he can get away with it and the, the fourth the state let him get away with it. Uh, personally, I think it'll be the suite of measures altogether that will be uh, most effective. Why you wouldn't make that aware? I mean, there's a, uh, you know, standing up in front of a, you know, a, 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 a cruise, uh, you know, a, a new boat today is uh, Mr Abbott's attempt to say this is an open government, but then he runs away from any questions about the details. I, I believe in an open government and uh, making sure that the Australian people know what's going on. Dantine, your response yeah, to that? Uh, I mean, it's been difficult with the lack of information and Tony Abbott, again, refused to even say whether this new St George Cape class would be even a vessel used to uh, turn boats back at sea. Look, the information is being provided. It's just being done in a way which in no way can it influence operational matters or jeopardise operational matters, and that's, that's incredibly important. So the information is there. The, the government is being transparent, but we're just doing it in a way to make sure that every effort and all of the suite of policy measures have, has a chance to have its impact. And I think by doing that, we're sending a, a clear message to the um, people smugglers, this won't be a, a knee-jerk reaction, this won't be a day-by-day -day reaction. We are systematically going to break your model of business. And that is why we're doing it in this way. And we don't want to in any way jeopardise operational matters in making sure that we end this trade. OK, I want to turn attention now to the issue of foreign investment. It's been a hot topic in last week and uh, look at something that has been on the minds and uh, part of discussions with Tony Abbott at the various uh, summits overseas. Now, we spoke to uh, Peter Reith this morning on AM Agenda and there is a pending decision on the Grain Corp takeover. This is what he had to say on the issue. You can't say, look, we're open for business and then uh, close down 
uh, you know, a big uh, American investment. I mean, Australia has been built on investments from the UK and, uh, and the US, and I'm certainly totally opposed to uh, the idea that we would somehow put, uh, uh, you know, put, a, put an end to that particular uh, commercial proposition. So I think, they, I think it'll go through. So, Dan T, and the point Peter Reith is making there is the Coalition can't say we're open for business and then not let this Grain Corp uh, takeover happen. Do you agree? Look, I, I think um, Peter Reith makes a, a valid point. We are saying we're open for business, and I think on this issue we do have to be careful uh, that we don't confuse the foreign investment issue with the legacy, legacy issues which remain in the grains industry as a result of us having a government-run monopoly and then deregulating uh, that monopoly. There are still some issues which need to be taken um, account of and there is a, a, a Wheat Industry Advisory Council at the moment which is dealing with some of those legacy issues and some of them are monopoly issues and I think that is where a, a lot of the, uh, you know, the discussion needs to be directed towards to make sure we get those issues right and the, the foreign investment part of it needs to be judged on its merits and you know the merits are is that uh, is that investment in Australia's national interest um, the ADM are saying that they will uh, significantly increase um, investment here in Australia. They're saying that, for instance, they will start rural um, scholarships uh, for regional and rural students. Uh, they're saying that all access arrangements will remain the same. They're the issues that we need to take into account when assessing um, the bid. And some of those legacy issues previously, I think there is another forum for them to be discussed and dealt with in. Uh, Graham Parrot, on the free trade agreements uh, more broadly, particularly when it comes to China, we know that uh, Tony Abbott uh, has set uh, an, a self-imposed deadline of uh, 12 months' time from now. Do you think this is achievable? Oh, well, look, it'll be an interesting debate, especially in the context of the Grain Corp and uh, the, the negotiations that have gone on. Uh, I, I note that the uh, Deputy Prime Minister in waiting, Barnaby Joyce, was you know, banging loudly the old uh, sinophobia, the, the fears of China in the lead up to the election in the few years before. I remember seeing his ads on, uh, on your channel. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how it, how it takes shape. Uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic about it, but, but uh, more optimistic than, than Richard Marles. Um, but I mean, he's the expert in this area, so I'd sort of uh, defer to him on, in, in terms of his comments on it. Uh, I always uh, have those reservations about uh, uh, like Dan, I guess, into what's in the nation's interests, what's in the nation's interests. Uh, we're a trading nation. Uh, we have been for a very long time. Uh, it's in our best interest to minimise the costs of trade so that we can sell our products to the world. But I'm also okay, a strong so believer in having a strong free manufacturing trade agreement sector. Or the rules, the FERB rules have to change. It's not one or the other in your view. Well, look, uh, I haven't, the negotiations have been going on for you know, nearly a decade, so there's, mm. there's all sorts of details there. Uh, I, I do have... Uh, look, the Foreign Investment Review Board has done great work over the years. Its focus is on making sure that Australia, uh, Australian interests are protected as well as, but not to the extent that it's going to bar us from going into other markets around the world. That's why we, we, we signed the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And, uh, you know, mm. Dan's farmers would, 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 make, would hate to be locked out of markets because of things that we're doing. But we've got to focus on making sure that the nation's interests are, are put first and foremost rather than the factories of China. Yeah, Dan Tian, on negotiations with the free trade agreement with China, does there need to be some give on the Foreign Investment Review Board rules? Does uh, the coalition maybe need to ha have uh, and re-look at the threshold in which the, the various uh, issues kick in at? No, look, I, I think we can put those thresholds in place and, and, and we should put those thresholds in place, but then they need to become part of the negotiation. For instance, when we're dealing with China, China does want to invest in Australia. We want to get market access into China. So if China is prepared to give our dairy products, our meat products, 
our services industry greater access into the Chinese market, then we should look at whether we would give them enhanced investment opportunities. And uh, you know, I, I think what you're going to see is a, is a real push from this government on these free trade agendas. I, I wouldn't be surprised, for instance, if we see the Japanese FTA concluded uh, very quickly. There are very limited um, issues outstanding on that agreement. Uh, I think the previous government was actually asleep on the wheel when it came to the Japan FTA. And I think once the Japanese Prime Minister visits Australia, we'll be able to deal with the agricultural issues, we'll be able to deal with investor state dispute settlement, which was one of the issues that the previous so Dan, government... just back on China quickly. Are you yep. saying if, if China gives us access to the sugar and dairy market, for example, should we change the threshold in which state-owned investments um, and the firm looks at state-owned investments. Is that something that you would support? Well, it, it, whether we look at it um, with regards to state-owned investments or, or private investment from private Chinese companies, this should be something that's on the table. It was something that was on the table when we negotiated the US Free Trade Agreement. It was something which was on the table when we negotiated the New Zealand Free Trade Agreement. So it should be part of the bargaining, absolutely. And if we can get increase market access for our goods into China and one of the, the, the pre, you know one of the trade offs there is is Chinese investment we're lifting the threshold here in Australia, we would be mad not to think about it. Hmm. Uh, All right, Dan T and Graham Perrot, we are going to take a quick break here. Graham will be back in a moment and we'll talk uh, more about foreign investment and also the Labor leadership decision pending this weekend. Stay with us. Welcome back to Lunchtime Agenda. Well, on Sunday, we will finally know who the Labor leader in opposition will be. Of course, it's a contest between Anthony Albanese and Bill Shorten. Half of that vote has already been cast. That is the vote by the Labor caucus. That was done yesterday, and it's widely reported and widely expected that Bill Shorten has won uh, the caucus vote. When it comes to the rank and file, well, Anthony Albanese is the front runner there. Yesterday's vote in caucus was largely down factional lines. But as Graham Richardson uh, pointed out on AM Agenda this morning, that this hasn't really been a factional race. Take a look. This is the most non-factional exercise that I've ever seen. And that, in fact, worries me because when, when the factions lose control, the party tends to drift. And I worry that, that it, as factions are decreasing in, in strength, and there's no doubt that's happening, that uh, anything's possible for Labor in the future. Now, Graham Perrett, this is an interesting argument put forward uh, by Graham Richardson. There's been talk within the Labor Party about uh, diluting the power of the factions. That's why these new rules have been put in place in the first place. But Graham Richardson there was making the argument for factions, saying with uh, factions being diluted, it's not actually good for the party. Where do you stand on this? Uh, well, I normally start by, in all things um, that Graham Richardson says, uh, by disagreeing with it. That's my starting position with anything he says, uh, and then work from there. And I, I'd say this. Look, factions, uh, same as in Dan's world, uh, whatever side of the chamber, whether the Greens, wherever it is, it's just groupings of people with similar interests, similar views. Uh, mm. The reality is there are 86 votes uh, cast in the Labor caucus. 86 people made up their minds individually, whether they're in a, in a strong faction, a weak faction, a, you know, a, a big faction, a small faction. 86 people still make up, made up their own mind about who they, who they voted for. Uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, the, reality, uh, the realities of machine uh, processes, you know, back from 20, 30 years ago when Richo was um, working the numbers, those days have changed. Uh, we've seen a complete change in union membership out in the workforce uh, and lot similarly we've seen a, a more fragmented approach to, to policies and views. But the Labor Party is stronger today than it was on uh, the day after the election. Why? Because we've engaged with the grassroots and with the community to talk about our, our plans for the future and our great legacy, uh, the legacy that uh, Dan will benefit from uh, while his uh, party's in government, be it for three years, six who, years or Brent, whatever. Who, who are you supporting and what's your sense? Who do you think will uh, be the leader come Sunday? Uh, look, I, I supported uh, Anthony Albanese. Uh, I saw a lot of him in Parliament over the last uh, six years, particularly the last three years where he had to 
you know, heard cats through that uh, minority government through the, the 43rd Parliament where it was hard to get a vote through, but he managed to do that 590 times. I saw him in his portfolio, with, uh, particularly with uh, infrastructure. He had some big piece of infrastructure go into my electorate uh, that will benefit the, the South East Queensland community. And I've also uh, had a lot to do with um, Bill Shorten in terms of disabilities in particular, uh, but education is a bit of my passion. So look, okay, wh whoever the leader is, whoever the leader is on Sunday, the important thing is that the Labor team is unified and stops talking about the old days when factions were divided and starts talking about one team, one agenda and a plan for the great nation of Australia. Dantine, I'll let you respond to that, but I also wanted to ask you about uh, the gay marriage bill due to pass the legis Legislative Assembly here in the ACT and uh, the Attorney General uh, indicating that they will try, that the Coalition federally will block that in the High Court. Now, is this the right path uh, to be going down? And what's the problem with the ACT passing this legislation? Laura, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that if that's right. I'd just like to address what Graham was saying about the Labor leadership. This seems to be we're dealing with another legacy issue. This time it's the Kevin Rudd legacy issue. And he says, you know, the important thing is that Labor will be united by the end of this process. Well, I can't see how that's going to work. I mean, first of all, you've got the caucus voting and their vote is weighted above the rank and file and then we'll have the rank and file voted. We still don't know but it would seem that there will be divisions between what the rank and file want and what the, the caucus wants and I think what we're seeing again is a, a Kevin Rudd mess and this is going to be another legacy issue that the Labor Party are going to have to deal with from all the division and dysfunction of the last six years. Uh, when it comes to the um, High Court uh, uh, challenge with regards to the ACT gay marriage laws. I, I think it's uh, quite clear that there are significant constitutional issues that this raises and I think the ACT government should pause and consider what it's doing because I don't think that they've really considered uh, the, you know, what, what are the impl serious implications of, of what they're doing. Uh, even um, Bill Shorten has mentioned that there are constitutional implications here and I think... But what are the serious implications? What are the serious implications? Well, them well going the, serious ahead the serious implications are that does the um, ACT have the right to, to make laws in, in this area or is it the Commonwealth that should be doing it? And, and that mean, it could potentially can change uh, the way that our constitution sets out how the federal government deals with territories. And so I, I think that they need to be, you know, seriously consider the approach they're taking here. And I, I would suggest that, you know, the uh, ACT attorney should sit down with our okay. attorney and, and work this out. OK. Graham Perrett, your response quickly. Well, obviously, George Brandis would be worried about an outbreak in same-sex marriages because that could lead to a boost in um, politicians uh, from the coalition going to going to those marriages, and that could blow the budget. Obviously, uh, I mean, the uh, the current Attorney General uh, thought it was a good idea that the taxpayer should pay for him to go to a, a wedding. So I, I can understand why he's concerned, but but more seriously, uh, look, marriage is is a, diff a difficult. Uh, a uh, difficult matter for the Commonwealth, obviously since 1961 when um, Sir Garfield Barwick brought in the Marriage Act. Well, so, to, so we had one set of rules for all the states and territories. Uh, it, it will be interesting to see. It's, it's actually not going to be so much on the marriage issue but more about federation. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the High Court processes this. Uh, okay. I'm, um, uh, yeah, look, the word marriage is in the, the Constitution, Section 51 of the, uh, the, our Constitution does refer to it. Uh, but I think it, the, the great irony might be that Mark Latham and John Howard coming together in 2004 to change that definition of marriage to be a man and a woman exclusively could actually be the window for uh, people, same-sex couples, to actually get married and have okay. a long, committed, monogamous relationship. We are, we are going to have to leave it there. Graham Perrett, Dan Tian, thanks so much for joining us on Lunchtime Agenda. That is it for the show. The news is next.